The Philosophy of Praxis, Marx, Lucas, and the Frankfurt School by Andrew Feinberg. Chapter 6, The Controversy Over Subject-Object Identity. The Antinomy of Society and Nature. The discussion of Marx's manuscripts in Chapter 3 concluded with a critique of his solution to the antinomy of society and nature. His early philosophy of praxis reduced nature to society both practically and theoretically. In his later work, he turned away from this approach. We have now seen that Lucas's interpretation of classical German philosophy leads to the similarly ambitious claim that the identical subject-object will overcome reification, the form of objectivity of both nature and capitalist society. This would seem to imply the incorporation of nature into society as in Marx's manuscripts. Lucas was a product of an intellectual environment that favored the idea of independent Geistin, uh, Geistis Wissenschaften, based on methods different from those of the natural sciences. He was its representative on the left, defending Geist against theoretical reification by bourgeois social science and vulgar Marxism. He develops the argument with natural science in familiar terms. While the logic of his position seems to demand that he reduce nature to history, he never goes so far. There are several passages in history and class consciousness in which, in which he affirms the independence of nature and the validity of the sciences that study it. His argument is thus either more complex or less consistent than Marx's. His critics have focused on the resulting contradictions ever since. Well, while it is all too easy to caricature Lucas's position, I will propose a charitable interpretation in this chapter. The interpretive challenge is twofold. As we have seen, the second part of the reification essay ends with Lucas's argument that classical German philosophy fails to resolve the antinomies of bourgeois thought. He promises a Marxist resolution, but the third part of the essay does not deliver it. Instead, it presents a rather disorganized exploration of the social implications of the identical subject-object and proletarian revolution. This leaves the impression that Lucas is caught between the poles of an antinomy dividing society and nature. In addition, Lucas's defense of history and class consciousness purports to explain his position but actually shifts the focus significantly through the introduction of a more conventionally Marxist perspective on the determining role of the economy. He drops references to the concept of reification and instead draws on its sources in Marx's mature work and Hegel's dialectic of essence for a different and presumably more orthodox vocabulary. Nevertheless, the defense is help for, helpful for understanding his position. In it, he argues rather obscurely for an absolute historicism that is more plausible than Marx's version. This chapter will consider the implication of these texts for Lucas's early Marxism and once again relate his position to Marx's manuscripts. The issue turns on the meaning of Lucas's concept of subject-object identity. This concept is a particular target of attack for critics ranging from the Althusserians to the Frankfurt School. The former explains Lucas's identity philosophy as a consequence of his supposed romantic rejection of natural science. The latter claims that identity philosophy is rooted in the Pr Promethean project of domination of nature and asserts the insuperable separation of subject and object. In contrast to all these critics, I will argue that the theory is neither romantic nor Promethean. Puzzling as is his concern with the concept of subject-object identity, Lucas has good reasons for not simply abandoning it as a historical curio curiosity. In the context of philosophy of praxis, it signifies the rationality of reason, the universality of its claims, and the freedom of the human species from mystical powers. The previous chapter summarized the theoretical ex exigencies that the identical subject-object is supposed to satisfy the principle of practice, history as reality, and dialectical method.
The identical subject object satisfies the demand of the principle of practice that the action of the subject penetrate the object, leaving no thing in itself untouched. It posits history as reality in the sense that the subjects and objects of all cognitive domains are explained through their function in the historical totality. And it involves dialectical method insofar as historical subject object identity is understood, not as immediate, but as mediated in an interaction of theory and practice, subjectivity and its objectifications. Bourgeois identity philosophy establishes only a commonality of form of subject and object. Lucas's metacritique aims to go beyond this toward a deeper unity based on the production of the object by the subject. But what is the meaning of Lucas's concept of production? As we have seen in the last chapter, the text appears to supply not one but two answers. I will review them both here as they relate to the problem of nature. Lucas's principle of practice is sometimes explained as the creation of the object by the subject or its absolute reduction to human relations. This is Lucas's later interpretation of history and class consciousness, which he considers more Fichtean than Hegelian. In this quasi fictian interpretation, the identity of subject and object implies the preeminence of the subject in a radically different form of society transparent to human knowledge and will. This resembles Marx's speculative notion of labor in the manuscripts. In that early text, the ontic power of labor to create is granted ontological significance as the fundamental access to being. In the last chapter, I argued that Lucas holds a properly Hegelian view based on the concept of mediation so far as society is concerned, but he insists that nature has a quasi-independent status. He thus avoids a transcendental humanism in which the creative power of the divinity would be exercised by human agents. His saving inconsistency is his explicit recognition that finite human subjects cannot constitute nature as they have history. Furthermore, even in the passages that appear most productivist, where Lucas exaggerates the role of the proletariat, he is careful to qualify the argument to note that the subject of practice operates under given historical conditions that determine the limits of its agency. In these passages, practice does not create, but rather mediates the object. Here, the subject in no way resembles a collective cogito, a transcendental ego outside a world it constitutes. The subject does not posit society, but is a moment of society, determined as well as determining. Such a subject penetrates its objects by altering their form of objectivity in accordance with their real potentialities. This ontological interpretation of subject-object identity establishes the unbounded reach of rationality at the level of function and meaning. This account, or sorry, this second approach is elaborated in a dialectical theory of rationality, according to which the proletariat constitutes itself as a subject through a continuing process of mediation of its own reified form of objectivity. Subjective and objective dimensions are united through an active process and not simply identified conceptually. The argument is Hegelian. Reason arises from understanding and dialectics from analytic rationality. Perhaps the ambiguity in Lucas's notion of production can be traced back to Hegel. There are two patterns of dialectical development in Hegel. In one pattern, synthesis leaves behind its contradictory origin by creating a third entity. This is the pattern exemplified by Hegel's view of, sorry, this is the pattern exemplified by Hegel's view of historical development. Generalized, this pattern leads to a metaphysical interpretation of Hegel's thought in which, for example, the system culminates in a panlogical god of some sort. But there is another pattern in which a continuing mediation between contradictory entities transforms or defines them without dissolving them into a third. This pattern is exemplified in Hegel's notion of being at home in the other as such. It is the pattern of life which objectifies itself in its environment, transforming object and subject without abolishing their difference. 
This is the implicit pattern of the logic in which successive concepts represent possible ways of knowing and being. The sequence of these concepts reflects increasing complexity and completeness, not the results of a production process in the usual sense. Marx followed the tendency of Hegel's historical writings in imagining a third. Communism would leave capitalism and its proletariat behind in the creation of a new form of society. The abolition of the commodity form would once and for all transcend the contradictions of capitalism. But once capitalism is conceived as a rationalized society and the Marxist critique generalized to the forms of rationality, the revolution cannot culminate in a third. Socialism can no longer pretend to restart the clock of history because the past is ever renewed in the rationalized social institutions at the basis of modernity. Lucas's identical subject object looks like the impossible third in his more florid descriptions of its revolutionary power, but his version of dialectics describes a relation between rational form and its objects or contents. He repeatedly states that the theory is about the tension between those contents, the life process of the proletariat, and economic, bureaucratic, and technological rationality. It is unclear how that tension could be definitively resolved. A quasi-Fictian interpretation makes the utopian claim that reification can be wholly overcome in a future socialist society. Even allowing for the persistent reification of nature, as Lucas does, this is a puzzling view. Lucas is supposed to have imagined an identical subject object, the actions of which would have no objective limits and no unintended consequences. With the complete abolition of reification, the subject would be free to create the world according to its arbitrary will. Whether or not Lucas intended his theory to be taken to such an extreme as his critics usually assume, it is fair to say that he left himself open to misinterpretation. In fact, his early philosophy of praxis was immediately criticized both on these grounds and for its inability to give a consistent account of the concept of nature. I will review several of these original critical arguments here, as well as more recent ones. These concern Lucas's supposed idealism and romanticism, the false identification of objectification and alienation in his concept of reification, and his unacceptable dualism of society and nature. I will argue that these criticisms, criticisms overlook the dialectical theory of rationality. In the conclusion of this chapter, I will consider whether, whether that theory offers resources for resolving the antinomy of society and nature, haunting his claim that revolutionary action can realize philosophy. The Critiques Ibrahim Deberin and Laszlo Rudis wrote two of the major early critiques of history and class consciousness. They accused Lucas of idealism from a Leninist perspective and introduced the main themes of later critique, particularly orthodox Marxist critique. Debrin and Rudis claim that Lucas sets angles against Marx in order to substitute his own idealistic dialectic for their materialistic dialectic. In a footnote to the first essay of history and class consciousness, Lucas does actually reject the application of dialectics to nature and offers an interpretation of historical dialectics he distinguishes rather sharply from that of Engels. It is of the first importance to realize that the method is limited here to the realms of history and society. The misunderstandings that arise from Engels' account of dialectics can in the main be put down to the fact that Engels, following Hegel's mis mistaken lead, extended the method to apply also to nature. However, the crucial determinants of dialectics, the, intera the interaction of subject and object, the unity of theory and practice, the historical changes in the reality underlying the categories as the root cause of changes in thought, etc., are absent from our knowledge of nature. This seems to imply that nature and society are separate domains to which correspond separate methods of study. Rudis writes, if the dialectic is restricted to society, then two worlds exist, with two quite different sets of laws, nature and society. In nature, phenomena are undialectical. In society, they are dialectical. According to Owl, the world is dualist. 
Jebring calls this a new conception of dialectical method, a conception which contradicts that of Marxism. Debring goes on to argue that Lucas is an idealist who sees in the category of knowledge, in a certain sense, the substance or truth of reality. In his dialectic, practice and historical reality are supposedly aufgehoben in knowledge. Hence, according to Lucas, practice is overcome only through theory, only through knowledge, and not through the self-development of reality, of which knowledge is simply a part. Debrin sees Lucas as a traditional idealist, completely overlooking his revision of the subject-object concept. The object, Debrin declares, is swallowed by the subject. Debrin concludes by contrasting this theory with orthodox Marxism. Knowledge, he objects, is never identical with its objects, but tends asympto asympto sorry, asymptotically toward accurate representation. The true unity of subject and object is to be found in the domain of labor practice, not in revolutionary class consciousness. The object with which Marxism is specifically concerned is nature, the substratum of human life. The subject is labor, and their unity, not identity, is the process of production. Like many later critics of Lucas, Debrin misses the point because he goes because he does not grasp the originality of Lucas's concept of consciousness, which is not identifiable with knowledge in the usual sense. Merleau-Ponty clarifies Lucas's distinction between consciousness and knowledge. In the proletariat, class consciousness is not a state of mind or knowledge, nor yet is it a theoretical construction, because it is a praxis that is to say less than a subject and more than an object. More precisely, class consciousness denotes the inner tendency of the historically significant actions of the class as a whole, in which it enacts new meanings in conflict with capitalist society. These new meanings are not thoughts in the heads of the proletarians, but functional shifts in the totality. It is thus incorrect to argue that for Lucas, consciousness transcends practice or that the subject swallows the object. Lucas's goal is to overcome the opposition of theory and practice, subject and object, in a region of historical reality where they stand in essential and necessary relation. But by defining the Lucasian subject as a knower, Debrin forces the theory back into a traditional idealistic framework it is designed to escape. In his new foreword of 1967, Lucas himself discusses these problems and suggests another critique that is surely unique as an example of philosophical self-misunderstanding. He describes how the reading of Marx's 1844 manuscripts finally convinced him of the ontological priority of objectivity and the universality of objectification. Therewith, says the older Lucas, his earlier Marxist work became completely alien to him. He dismisses his own identity theory as an attempt to out Hegel or to out Hegel Hegel. <laughs> Many other critics have similarly charged the early Lucas with confounding, as did Hegel, objectification with alienation in the concept of reification. This is the line taken in Adorno's influential critique. This critique carries the imprimatur of a great thinker. It is elaborated against a sophisticated theoretical background and represents the tradition of the Frankfurt School which shared Lucas's ambition to construct a Marxist philosophy on the ruins of German idealism. Adorno claims that Lucas lapsed into idealism, believed the proletarian subject could constitute social reality independent of any institutional framework or objective constraint on its action, and idealized immediacy in pre-capitalist society. Quite a program. And Adorno does not hesitate to associate his critique with that of the Stalinists, who first denounced Lucas, including presumably Deborin and Rudis. There's a good deal of irony in the fact that the brutal and primitive functionaries who more than 40 years back damned Lucas as a, her uh, as a heretic because of the reification chapter in his important history in class consciousness did sense the idealistic nature of his conception. If a man looks upon thingness as radical evil, if he would like to dynamize all entity into pure actuality, 
he tends to be hostile to otherness, to the alien thing that has lent its name to alienation, and not in vain. Unfortunately, Adorno's critique is no better than the Stalinist ones. Like them, he addresses a straw man. He claims that reification, which he too interprets as a cognitive phenomenon, is overcome by the de-reification of consciousness, rather than concrete social change in the real world of non-identical objects. The cause of human suffering, meanwhile, will be glossed over rather than denounced in the lament about reification. To make matters worth, to make matters worse, Adorno considers the critique of reification to be a version of romantic anxiety over the distancing effect of rationality. Blaming all problems on reification implies that immediacy is the solution. Reduced to the thesis that in criticizing reification, he is criticizing the very independence of the object, Lucas seems to call for assimilating things to the stream of consciousness or action. So Adorno writes, the liquefaction of everything thing-like regressed to the subjectivism of the pure act. The reference here is at once to a kind of existentialist decisionism and to the fictian actus purus, in which the world is posited by transcendental consciousness. Versions of this critique abound in the literature, and after becoming acquainted with them, few, with them, few readers both to go back to the original, um, much less read it with fresh eyes. I don't think that sentence made sense. But in the first pages of his book, Lucas warns the reader that the concept of totality under which he conceives social reality does not reduce its various elements to, uh, to an undifferentiated uniformity, to identity. This reservation is confirmed elsewhere in the text, despite the often overblown language in which Lucas describes the identical subject object. Under the rhetorical surface, his views depend on a rather conventional Marxism, not the rehash of subjective idealism and naive romanticism Adorno attributes to him. In sum, Marx, not Heraclitus or Bergson, <laughs> It is certainly worth questioning whether this is coherent, but it is hardly idealist, but requires understanding as Lucas's purpose in producing this strange hybrid of classical German philosophy and the Marxist critique of political economy. We need to know whether he accomplished anything of interest in doing so. Ignoring the complexity of his thought is not helpful for this purpose. Lucas and Ficht. These considerations take us to the heart of the problem. Lucas never entirely bridges the enormous gap between the two poles of his argument, classical German philosophy and Marxism. Curious exaggerations expose him to easy criticism. Axel Honneth notes the coexistence of a hopelessly idealistic official line and a more moderate unofficial line that can provide the basis for a recovery of his contribution. We differ on the nature of that unofficial line, but not on the interest in pursuing the amb ambiguities of Lucas's argument. Lucas's ambition is to demonstrate that the core of being stands revealed as a social process. He can only achieve this if, as Ficht would have it, he can exhibit the subject of action and, assuming its identity with the object, comprehend every dual subject-object form as derived from it, as its product. According to Tom Rockmore, Ficht is the source of the emphasis on activity not only in Lucas, but in Marx as well. This would explain why Lucas has recourse to the decidedly non-materialist notion of an identical subject-object. Lucas's views on nature are incompatible with this interpretation, but there are occasional passages in history in class consciousness, such as the one cited above, which seem to support it. Sometimes the critique of reification seems to extend to the reified form of objectivity of nature as well as society, and there are borrowings from contemporary critiques of natural science. Several critiques leap at the bait and argue with Alfred Schmidt that nature in Lucas is totally dissolved into the historical processes of its appropriation in respect of form, content, e extent, and objectivity. Surprisingly, no one has gone on to complete the critique of Lucas implicit in such assertions. 
If Lucas really believed that the revolution would overcome all objective being in overcoming reification, his theory would be both rigorously consistent and obviously absurd. Then nature would be posited by the identical subject-object of history, and in overcoming social reification, the proletariat would transform nature itself. This Fichtean interpretation of Lucas's theory rests on the following pr propositions, which outline an, an ontological and epistemology in conformity with the critic's image of Lucas, if not with Lucas's actual views. One, nature is a purely social category, and the natural world therefore has no independence of humanity and human understanding. Two, nature is essentially reified under capitalism. Three, the identical subject-object of history is also the identical subject-object of nature. Four, proletarian revolution therefore overcomes the reified objectivity of nature in overcoming capitalism. Five, since the existing natural sciences are reified and therefore conditioned by capitalist society both in their genesis and their validity, proletarian revolution also overcomes these sciences in overcoming capitalism. This summary of Lucas's theory is immensely overdrawn, but it has the virtue of rendering one commonplace interpretation rigorously consistent. If the critics are correct in attributing some such views to Lucas, then they are also right to tax him with idealism. In this theory, the entire existing world is a product of human activity. All that would distinguish Lucas's Marxism from other forms of idealism would be his insistence that this constituting activity is social in character. But does this construct, or sorry, but does this construct really concern theses sustained in history and class consciousness? <clears throat> or even its distant implications? The careful reader discovers no significant support for this interpretation, while there are numerous positive statements to the contrary. This is, in fact, the myth of Lucas's famous book that prejudices the very reading of the text. What is Lucas's concept of nature? Let us begin with the passage usually cited in support of the interpretation sketched above. Lucas does say that nature is a social category, but he proceeds immediately to qualify this statement. The entire passage reads, nature is a social category, that is to say, what passes for nature at a, at a determinate stage in social evolution, the constitution of the relation between this nature and man, and the form in which the confrontation of man and nature takes place, in short, what nature signifies in its form and its content, its range and its objectivity are all socially conditioned. The opening sentence of this passage is often quoted to show that Lucas believed nature in itself, without qualification, to be a social product. But the second sentence is quite careful to discuss not nature as such, but only what passes for nature. And surely Lucas intends this qualification, since he introduces the second sentence with, that is to say, as equivalent to, but more precise than the preceding one. In the defense, the distinction is explicit. I talk always, on two occasions, only of knowledge of nature and nature and not nature itself. Already the first and the third theses of the construct have fallen. For now, nature itself, if not the knowledge of it, is independent of man and cannot possibly be posited by society. And then, of course, the, for the fourth thesis is also untenable. For under these conditions, proletarian revolution cannot transform nature. Nevertheless, Lucas continues to affirm, if not exactly the second and fifth theses, something quite similar. He says, It cannot be our task to investigate the question of the priority or the historical and causal order of successions between the laws of nature and capitalism. The author of these lines has, however, no wish to conceal his view that the development of capitalist economics takes precedence. In addition, at the end of the reification essay, when Lucas concedes that there is an objective dialectic of nature, he distinguishes it from the dialectic of subject and object in history. He notes that the growth of knowledge about nature is a social phenomenon and therefore to be included in the second dialectical type. Thus the fate of the natural sciences and that of capitalism would still seem to be intimately intertwined. <clears throat> 
just how intimately only becomes clear in the defense to be discussed below. These statements combined with a critique of reification have been used by Coletti and others to believe to build an image of an irrationalist Bergsonian Lucas. Yet Lucas himself rejects irrationalism as an immediate reflex of reification. The value of formal knowledge in the face of living life may be questioned. See irrationalist philosophies from Hammond to Bergson. But Lucas writes, reification is not thereby transcended. Whether this gives rise to ecstasy, resignation, or despair, whether we search for a path leading to life via a rational, mystical experience, this will do absolutely nothing to modify the situation, situation as it is in fact. Another significant passage makes clear Lucas's disagreement with the irrationalist attack on the natural sciences. After a lengthy and apparently Bergsonian critique of the application of natural scientific method to society, a critique that seems at points to cast doubt on the validity of science in general. Lucas states, When the epistemological ideal of the natural sciences is applied to nature, it simply furthers the progress of science. But when it is applied to society, it turns out to be an ideological weapon of the bourgeoisie. Lucas's precise attitude toward the fifth thesis should now be clear. He does believe the rise of capitalism to have stimulated the growth of modern natural science, but he nowhere proposes that it is therefore false or that proletarian revolution will abolish it. The validity of natural science and of the reified concept of nature seems to be independent of the conditions of its creation. Here Lucas is in agreement with the views of the leader Marx and Engels. After examining all these passages in detail, one is astonished to discover that nothing remains of the image of Lucas as a subjective idealist at the level of the collective eye of the proletariat, Lucas the rationalist, the Bergsonian, an image that begins with Deborin in 1924 and continues to contemporaries such as Coletti. While Rockmore may be right to suggest that Fichte's activist conception of subjectivity influenced Lucas, Lucas was no Fichtean. In fact, the Lucas of history and class consciousness has a quite banal respect for the natural sciences. He nowhere denies the independence of nature or the validity of the sciences that study it, but this raises other questions. Lucas's goal is to overcome the antinomy of subject and object and restore their unity through action and history. But how can reason be founded on the identity of subject and object in history while nature in itself remains beyond the scope of human action? To the extent that nature is conceived as irreducible and non-social in a dualistic worldview, the whole theoretical superstructure collapses. Stephen Vogel has made this dualism of nature and society the centerpiece of his critique. Vogel focuses on Lucas's failure to incorporate nature into his social theory. Uh, the distinction between knowledge of nature and nature itself seems a regression to Kantianism. What is this nature that by, de that by definition lies beyond knowledge, if not the old thing in itself? Unless the identity of subject and object in nature can be established, its identity in history appears as a purely contingent feature of the universe. Another type of rationality with its own objectivity arises alongside history, and there, subject and object can never be united. It can never be united. Reason remains permanently caught in the antinomies of reified thought in its relation to nature. The Kantian construction of rationality now returns in full force, bringing in its train all the untranscended antinomies Lucas set out to resolve. It would seem that Lucas is saved from his critics only to fall into self-contradiction. Vogel claims that Lucas confuses an epistemological distinction with an ontological one. Lucas distinguishes between a reified, contemplative conception of knowledge that resembles positivism and a self-conscious dialectical conception. This epistemological distinction is independent of the distinction between nature and society. However, since Lucas accepts a contemplative conception of knowledge of nature that he rejects in the case of society, he concludes that nature and society are ontologically distinct domains.
Vogel objects to the very notion of a contemplative, contemplative epistemology, arguing that post-empiricist philosophy and sociology of science demonstrate that the subject of knowledge is practically implicated in the construction of scientific facts and theories. The de-reifying critique of social science Lucas pursues can thus be extended to natural science as well. Knowledge of nature, like social knowledge, is dialectical. There are no epistemological grounds for distinguishing their objects. Vogel argues that if there is something in nature that is not socially produced, then history is not reality, not the fundamental ontological domain from which all others are derived. Unless some solution can be found, Lucas's philosophy of praxis will collapse into a limited methodological preliminary to historical research. It could no longer pretend to solve ontological problems, but only epistemological problems of historical knowledge. Reason would not be implicated in revolution, only in social theory. This is, in fact, the position adopted by Lucien Goldman, Lucas's most important follower. Vogel, Vogel is more critical. He writes that this solution to the contradiction has a comic character since Lucas will have labored long and hard and brought forth a mouse. Contemplative and Transforming Consciousness Many critics agree with Rudis and Vogel that the methodological split between society and nature and history and class consciousness gives rise to serious problems for Lucas' philosophy of praxis. However, it is not uncommon for the critics, including the leader Lucas himself, to fail to notice that this split refutes the idealistic identification of his concept of objectivity with Hegel's concept of alienation. For if nature is not posited by society, as Lucas seems to assert, and if it is not transcended in the revolution, then clearly Lucas's philosophy is not hostile to objectivity per se and is not idealist. The critics produce an empirically accurate image of the various strands of Lucas's thought, but at the expense of a theoretically inconsist inconsistent critique. Lucas is charged with the contradictory vices of identifying what should be separated, alienation and objectivity, and separating what should be identified, nature and history. Lucas's dilemma arises from the apparently incompatible solutions to the two problems the identical subject-object is supposed to solve. In the first place, Lucas explains social change through the concept of social self-consciousness. This notion is loosely based on the Marxist theory of the proletariat and its place in capitalist society. The class in itself becomes the class for itself. The self-consciousness of the proletariat transforms its immediate form of objectivity and therewith society. In the second place, Lucas proposes an integrally historical ontology that can resolve the antinomies of classical German philosophy, but proletarian self-consciousness cannot transform the immediate form of objectivity of nature. This is what it means to argue that nature is essentially reified, as Lucas implies in several of the passages cited above. The dilemma appears inescapable until one grasps the full import of Lucas's dialectical theory of rationality. Most readings of Lucas accuse him of inflating the subject at the expense of the object, but the theory of rationality emphasizes the objectivity of the proletariat and the limits of its action. Proletarian practice does not create social reality, but rather mediates it. Since all mediation begins with a presupposition, an immediate of some sort, this raises the question of the nature of the presupposition in the case of the proletariat. If the presupposition is wholly extrinsic to its action, then the problem of the thing in itself does indeed return. This describes reified technical practice that acts on an alien object. Reification cannot be defeated by such practice, but if the mediated lies wholly within the subject of mediation, then is not its alterity abolished in a perfectly idealist manner? This describes psychoanalysis in which the object of practice is actually an unconscious aspect of the subject, 
As I showed in the previous chapter, Lucas is aware of the dilemma and attempts to conjure it away in the reification essay. He argues that reification is gradually overcome in a long-term process and not dissolved in a sudden recovery of absolute agency. This process is not technical but transformative, in the sense that it does not merely use the law of its objects to advantage, but alters that very law. Nor is it therapeutic. Freud's version of self-consciousness is impossible in a social context where objective constraints arise from the institutional heritage and the interactions of the individuals. But human freedom and initiative can increase relative to the structural impediments of a rationalized society as the proletariat initiates the transition to socialism. Lucas makes this point repeatedly in different ways throughout the third section of the reification essay but never applies the argument to the problematic of classical German philosophy analyzed earlier in the essay. He writes, for example, that proletarian thought does not require tabula rasa, but rather starts out from reification that, for the first time, makes it possible to understand that society is a human product. Socialism is a reorganization of the society around a dialectical mediation of the reified capitalist inheritance. He argues further that reification is never completely eliminated, but that it is repeatedly overcome in an unbroken alternation of ossification, contradiction, and movement. And he rejects the humanist tendency to make man himself into an absolute in place of those transcendental forces he was supposed to explain, dissolve, and systematically replace. The proletariat does not constitute or posit reality from some transcendental beyond. It is true that the proletariat is the conscious subject of total social reality, but the conscious subject is not defined here as in Kant, where subject is defined as that which can never be an object. Lucas invokes Hegel's famous principle that the true be understood not only as substance but also as subject. Like the Hegelian absolute, the proletariat too moves in a self-created world, but that world simultaneously imposes itself upon it, upon it in full objectivity. The reference to the ambitious notion of a self-created world is thus instantly deflated by the full objectivity explained in Marxist social theory. Since Lucas does not show how these considerations apply to the problem of nature, his critics doubt he can fulfill the promise to transcend the antinomy of subject and object. But there's a hint of a solution in the very terms on which Lucas questions the, the dialectics of nature. As we saw earlier, he is saved from idealism by the dualism of nature and history implied in the claim that nature lacks the most important determinations of dialectics, namely the unity of the theory and practice and the interaction of subject and object. Later in history and class consciousness and in the defense, Lucas refers to an objective dialectic of nature, corresponding to Hegel's objective dialectic of the categories of thinghood, such as quantity and quality. He reiterates that this level of the dialectic lacks the all-important interaction of subject and object with the social dialectic. Although the distinction between nature and society is apparently ontological, it is presented twice in these passages in methodological terms. This suggests a very different reading of Lucas. He is not telling us what kind of being nature is, but on what terms it can be changed, on what terms the proletariat as subject and or subject can interact with this object. The argument is thus not about the difference between the essence of society and nature, but about their different relation to practice. Forms of consciousness follow from this distinction. Lucas distinguishes between contemplative and transforming consciousness, the one suited to knowledge of nature, the other to knowledge of society. There's a realm in which consciousness is practiced, in which we can transform our objects by becoming socially self-conscious, and, alongs and alongside it, there is another realm in which our action will always be contemplative, i.e. technical. The first realm is society, the second is nature. Lucas claims that we need not organize our whole social life through technical control of some human beings by others, as capitalism requires, 
but that we will always stand in a technical relation to nature. The concept of contemplative consciousness is essentially constructivist, despite the usual meaning of the word. Lucas's constructivism operates at the abstract level of the form of objectivity, rather than focusing on particular social influences on the content of knowledge, as do Marx's occasional, Marx's occasional remarks on science. For example, Lucas writes in History and Class Consciousness that it is in the nature of capitalism to process phenomena in such a way as to generate facts. And he concludes, the unscientific nature of this seemingly so scientific method of bourgeois social science consists then in its failure to see and take account of the historical character of the facts on which it is based. As we saw in chapter four, factuality is a social product, not an immediate given. What Lucas calls contemplation hides the social practices that institute the facts. Reified social reality is a second nature, with laws that appear as rigid as those of the first nature described by natural science. Man in capitalist society confronts reality made by himself as a class which appears to him to be a natural phenomenon alien to himself. He is wholly at the mercy of its laws. His activity is confined to the exploitation of the inexorable fulfillment of certain individual laws for his own egoistic interests. But even while acting, he remains, in the nature of the case, the object and not the subject of events. The three principal cases of a modern society, the economy, the technology, and the administrations, are reified objects of contemplation in the sense that the individual cannot alter the laws of the system made by himself as a class, but only understand and manipulate those laws to personal advantage. But in these social instances, a collective practice based on the self-consciousness of the social subjects can, trans can transform the laws themselves. It is obvious that nature, at least in the form in which it is encountered in natural science, does not form a fourth system contingent on capitalism for its existence and immediately transformed by the collective consciousness qua practice in which capitalism is overthrown. This is so even if we accept Lucas's constructivist interpretation of contemplation according to which it masks an underlying practice. To be sure, contemplation of nature is not truly passive, but unlike in the social case, de-reifying consciousness of the scientific construction of nature does not necessarily alter the facts of nature itself. This distinction is clarified by Paul Dumouchel's revision of systems theory. He distinguishes two types of spontaneous orders or systems constituted by agents who each follow a rule of action individually. Some spontaneous orders are rational in the sense that they are stable in the face of the agent's discovery of the rule of the system. Competitive games are examples of rational orders. The player's willingness to play by the rules is not normally affected by their knowledge of the rules. But there are also spontaneous orders that are irrational in the sense that when the agents come to understand the rule of their action, they will necessarily modify it. Dumouchel offers the example of sacrifice or scapegoating, considered by René Girard to provide a basic mechanism of social solidarity. The sacrificial logic cannot withstand the revelation that the rule of scapegoating is the random or arbitrary choice of the victim. The object of the sacrifice is an ordinary person, as guiltless as those who kill him. Sacrifice is cancelled by the self-consciousness of the sacrificial community. In Dumouchel's scheme, the passage beyond irrationality through consciousness can lead to the creation of a rational order governed by new rules, or a reasonable order based not merely on individual action, but planned collectively in terms of such explicit norms as justice. On these terms, reified social forms constitute irrational orders that can be transformed once the agents understand their logic. The capitalist system is not based on rationality in Dumouchel's sense, but on blindness. It cannot withstand the discovery of its own inner logic by those who enact it. 
The alternative suggested by the mediation theory is the institution of a permanent system of transitions from the irrational to the rational and the reasonable. But the relation to nature is not irrational in Du, in du Mouchel's sense. It is not generally modified by consciousness of its reified form. It is thus essentially reified and knowledge of it is, dis is destined to remain permanently contemplative. Natural History Instead of a one-time and total de-reification of the sort promised by the idealist version of the identical subject-object, the theory of rationality proposes a more nuanced interpretation that leaves room for objectivity. A sliding ontological scale includes aspects of the objective world that are more or less resistant to de-reification. Some of these, the ones that are specifically social, such as wage labor, labor, wage labor, are susceptible to much more radical transformation than others, such as the nature studied by the natural sciences. Other objects such as art and technology and the lived nature of everyday experience stand in between the extremes, more contingent, more contingent on human action than the nature of natural science, but less so than social institutions. In each case, subject, in each case, subject and reified object interact as moments in a totality. This version of subject-object identity abolishes the thing in itself, not by reducing it to the subject, but, but by mediating objectivity in a never-ending process. But this means that the identical subject-object is not a substantial thing in the usual sense of the word, identical to itself and enduring through change. Rather, the identical subject-object is a process of self and social transformation that appears and fades with the rhythms of the historical struggle. This interpretation of subject-object identity can provide a framework for understanding Lucas's response to the various criticisms described above, especially if the more elaborate arguments of the defense are taken into account. In the defense, Lucas goes beyond the few brief comments on science and history and class consciousness. However, this text is an unfinished first draft, not a published or not a polished publication. Its significance is obscured by Lucas's avoidance of his own philosophical terminology. He no longer refers to forms of objectivity and reification, presumably because he does not think such concepts acceptable in the new Soviet context of the debate. He writes instead about the metabolic interaction of man and nature. By this, he means the labor process that mediates the natural world. He also refers to the appearance of society and to the mode of perception determined by the level and type of metabolic interaction. <clears throat> the emergence of new appearances and perceptions under socialism seems a euphemism for the transformation of the reified form of objectivity discussed in history and class consciousness. Although this change in terminology is confusing, other arguments in the defense clear up ambiguities in history and class consciousness. Vogel concludes from Lucas's distinction of nature and society that he accepts internalism and realism. But this is actually the view Lucas attributes to Rudis in his defense. He writes, for example, that comrade Rudis assumes an imminent development of the natural sciences. Both Deborn and Rudis claim that Science yields knowledge of things in themselves, as Engels famously argued in a discussion of the significance of synthetic chemistry and scientific experiment. This implies that science engages humanity in a direct relation to nature. Lucas argues that humanity is not the subject of scientific knowledge. Humanity is merely an abstract or an abstraction from the concrete social subjects that interact with nature and history. The cognitive relation to nature depends on the forms of the labor process, the metabolic interchange with nature imposed by the dominant economic system. He thus proposes a kind of suspectivism according to which economic systems open up ways of knowing. He points out furthermore that Marx himself interpreted certain scientific discoveries in terms of their social background for example, Marx claims that Darwin's theory of evolution reflects capitalist competition. <clears throat>
According to Lucas, this view does not lead to relativism since real progress can be observed in the development of the forces of production to which corresponds cognitive progress in the understanding of nature. The argument from progress is weak and Lucas does not follow it up in a very coherent manner, although he does make a few other suggestive remarks that conform with his theory of dialectical rationality. As we have seen, the capitalist system structures appearances in such a way as to privilege ahistorical facts. The socialist challenge to capitalism creates new cognitive possibilities. Lucas writes, It is altogether possible that the present crisis of the natural sciences is already a sign of the imminent revolutionizing of its material basis, and not merely a reflex of the general ideological crisis of capitalism in decline. However, as long as we are not in a position to demonstrate concretely the historical genesis of the emergence of our perceptions out of their material basis, i.e. not only that they are, but what they are and how, etc., as Marx accomplished for our socio-historical perceptions, our mode of looking is lacking an important objective moment of the dialectic. History. This passage and the discussion it introduces are peculiarly ambu ambi ambiguous. The ambiguity attaches to the word history. Does Lucas mean that scientific research will identify historical aspects of its object that are currently overlooked? Or does he mean that science as a process of inquiry will become reflexive, aware of its own historical conditioning? Both interpretations are implied once again in the following passage. To what extent all knowledge of nature can, can ever be transformed into historical knowledge cannot be raised here, because even where it seems to us that historical developments have occurred, their historical character can now be grasped only to a very small extent. This is because the capacity to discover the material foundations of knowledge and to derive knowledge from this material basis dialectically has not yet up until this point been produced by objective real developments. In fact, Lucas seems to want to affirm both the ambiguous senses of history in these passages. Here is a fuller account of these alternatives. 1. Lucas entertains the possibility of a new science emerging from the socialist transformation of the labor process. There's a basis for this view and a comment in the German ideology. Even this pure natural science receives, receives its aim, like its material, only through commerce and industry, through the sensuous activity of man. This comment is a pale reflection of some of the most adventurous speculations of the manuscripts reviewed in chapter three of this book. There, Marx writes, for example, that industry is the actual historical relation of nature and thus of natural science to man. The progress of industry is thus also progress in the human relationship to nature, i.e. sense experience. Objective human powers develop through the maturation and humanization of the senses in the course of history. The supersession of private property is therefore the complete emancipation of all the human qualities and senses. As experience is enhanced, science will be transformed. Natural science will one day incorporate the science of man. Just as the science of man will incorporate natural science, there will be a single science. Lucas proposes a somewhat similar but more modest theory in history and class consciousness. Experienced nature is no poetic shwarmeray, shwarmeray? <laughs> Distinguished, I definitely am pronouncing that really wrong. <laughs> Distinguished from the prose of machines and laboratory experiments by the absence of thought and reflection. The perception of nature is not immediate, but is always already mediated and formed by the metabolism of man and nature sensed and comprehended through or sorry comprehended through social forms of objectivity the reference to changed perceptions and their effects on scientific knowledge translated into the terminology of history and class consciousness means that everyday experience will be reshaped by new form of objectivity as capitalism's rigid opposition of factual form and living content gives way to the fluid interaction between them under socialism this notion offers a basis for understanding the possible evolution of science. Lucas argues in the defense that new perceptions will open a historical perspective on nature. 
Once human beings know that there are no eternal laws of society and institute that knowledge in a dynamic and self-conscious production system, they will also be predisposed to conceive nature in historical terms. Just as historical elements have already entered some fields of natural science through evolutionary theory and thermodynamics, so every branch of science will someday become historical. A new historically transformed a new historically informed science will yield new results reflecting the new structure of interchange with nature under socialism and the perceptions or form of objectivity that accompany it. Two, the second possible interpretation of Lucas's reference to a new science concerns inquiry itself rather than its results. The new perceptions introduced by socialism involve a continual alternation of de-reification and stabilization in society at large. This might also describe a new and more dynamic process of research in which a continual deconstruction of the reified heritage of earlier socially biased results would constitute the motor of scientific progress. Lucas admits that up to now, reflexivity has not been required to produce good research. Specialized knowledge of the highest quality has been and still is obtained by researchers with no special insight into their own social and historical situation. Indeed, contemplative epistemology and the correlated reification of nature represent a progress over earlier mythological forms of objectivity, and their usefulness is not exhausted. Furthermore, he does not even deny the contribution of reified contemplation to social knowledge prior to the prior to the development of the Marxist approach. But despite these concessions, Lucas suggests the usefulness of social critique of science, where its concepts retain traces of an, apt, of an obsolete mode of production. Such critique, he argues, will probably show that some categories that appear today as eternal, as categories directly taken from nature, e.g. work in physics, are actually historical determined by the specific exchange of matter between capitalist society and nature. The mechanical view of nature might be an example. According to Lucas's reflexive account, a de-reifying process of self-discovery can thus affect natural science. The theorist should become conscious that the categories in which he conceives objective reality, society, and nature are determined by the social being of his present moment that they are only mental summations of this objective reality. Categories are forms of existence, conditions of existence. But the outcome of such de-reification of nature is quite different from the de-reification of society, since nature as a system or totality does not depend on the unconsciousness of the practices in which it is understood, self-consciousness does not overthrow its reified form of objectivity, although some results of scientific research may indeed be overthrown. Conceivably, the accumulation of new theories arising from an ideolo ideology critique of science could lead to a new science, but little can be paid or little can be said oh no, I'm sorry, but little can be said of such a new science in this transitional period. Lucas writes that just how deeply the historically sorry, just how deeply the historically changing Therefore, historically ephemeral process of capitalist exchange of matter with nature determines our present knowledge of nature and where those categories that determine the metabolic exchange of any society with nature begin are questions for individual research. The de-reification of scientific knowledge would not transform nature into a human product in the usual ontic sense of the term. Insofar as the self-critique of science affects scientific change, it issues in a new positing of objective nature, indeed, the hallmark of scientific advance is that it gives access to a law that resists modification through self-consciousness. The reified dimension of nature on which natural science is based cannot be cancelled by a historical progress that would reveal its truths as human activities or human activity. Lucas seems to be arguing two apparently contradictory points. Social critique shows that the form of objectivity of nature is historically bound while scientific research establishes the transcendence of particular facts and theories, at least while they prevail. The conceptual framework in terms of which we identify nature is socially contingent, but knowledge of nature refers to objects independent of us, 
that is to presuppositions and not results of our practices. The success of a scientific fact in escaping critique need not be eternal to serve the purpose of the argument. Nature is a moving target. As Marcuse says, nature is not a manifestation of spirit, but rather its essential limit. And the position of that limit changes in history. Scientific knowledge is always already subject in principle, if not in present practice, to a critique that would refute particular results while establishing new ones as the new nature itself. These two points seem incompatible because we assume that if our conception of nature in general is socially conditioned, then all the results of research carry the stigma of a social origin and cannot yield knowledge of an independent reality. But Lucas argues that it is senseless to conclude from a social critique of the general concept of nature that particular results are merely relative. This would be to confuse social theory with research and to make of the former a systematic locus of absolute knowledge Finite knowledge is bound to a context. In the context of research, critique does not stand alone, but is a moment in a process leading to a new positive reality. Removed from, from that context, it cannot serve in a general argument for relativism or the existence of the thing in itself. Modern science knows the truth of nature in the only meaningful sense of the word. This is so even though the conceptual framework within which nature is known is reified, hence conceived in a socially relative perspective on the world. I think this is what Lucas means in the passage cited above by the need for individual research into the extent of social determination, in opposition, presumably, to general speculation. This is a Lucasian version of the finite horizon Marx deployed in 1844 to block the cosmological argument as we saw in chapter three. In support of his position, Lucas refers to Hegel's argument according to which the Kantian thing in itself is a pure thought object, an abstraction from all concrete existence. As such, it cannot be the ultimate reality because it depends on the subject of the process of abstraction. Under the finite horizon, history, not nature or the thing in itself is ultimate reality. The reification of nature is a moment of the historical process in which the experienced knowledge and technical control of nature develop. The social totality contains a reified moment, nature, that is not cancelled by self-consciousness, but which rather opens a realm of irreducible facts and theories. Nature may not be de-reified by human practice on the same terms as society, but its participation in the dialectic reveals it to be fundamentally historical. It is time to draw the conclusions of this argument. The concepts of de-reification and subject-object identity do not belong to a Fichtean metaphysics. These concepts are essentially methodological and not substantive. This is shown by Lucas's constant emphasis on the importance of methodology. Indeed, on the first page of History and Class Consciousness, he claims that Marxist orthodoxy refers exclusively to method. As Gillian Rose puts a similar point, Lucas turned the logic of constitutive principles away from a logic of identity in the direction of a theory of historical mediation. He means for us to take him literally when he describes proletarian thought, i.e. Marxism, his own theory, as a theory of practice that only gradually transforms itself into a practical theory that overturns the real world. As we saw in the case of the social application of the theory of dialectical rationality, this position is incompatible with the notion that reification characterizes only the bourgeois era. Given the internal link between reification and dialectics in the concept of mediation, it is impossible to eliminate the former without also eliminating the latter. Insofar as the truth is discovered dialectically, reification is a necessary moment in the process of discovery. Reification is, in sum, not the opposite of dialectics, but a moment in it. For if concepts are only the intellectual forms of historical realities when these forms, one-sided, abstract, and false, as they are, belong to the true unity as genuine aspects of it, insofar as the false is an aspect of the true, it is both false and non-false. What may nevertheless change radically in the course of history is the position of the reified moment in the totality to which it belongs. Istvan Metzros writes,
granting that it is unthinkable to supersede all possible dangers and potentials of reification is fully compatible with conceiving Afabung as a, as a succession of social enterprises of which the leader is less alienation ridden than the preceding one. Lucas's argument for historically self-conscious science is an example of such an advance. Methodological Universalism Modern thought claims universality for its science by contrast with culture that is relative to a local situation, a history. Science achieves universality by transcending such contingencies. The crisis of modern knowledge arises when it too is situated historically. This relativistic turn is often traced to Nietzsche's perspectivism. As we saw in chapter 3, it forbids a naive acceptance of the discontinuity between knowledge and culture. This makes it difficult to distinguish the, t the claims to truth of modern science from similar claims of any other ethnoscience in any other culture. This raises important questions about the global impact of the West that can be addressed with Lucas's concepts of reification and de-reification, although he himself did not so address them. Relativism seems to imply that the global triumph of Western science cannot claim to be based on epistemological superiority, but exclusively on military supremacy. But this is not the whole story. The success of Western modern modernity is not merely military, but depends on its critical force as well. It is at that level that something like the universality of modernity can be defended. But as Lucas argues, this universality is fraught with an internal contradiction. It suffers a tension between two forms of knowledge, a reifying and a de-reifying form. De-reification too is the basis of a modern way of knowing. It too is a critical method, although it operates in very different ways and circumstances from science. The tension between them reflects the imbrica imbrication of nature and history the full complexity of which is first appreciated by the Frankfurt School. It is the critical method of science and not an absolute truth content that qual truth content that qualifies it as universal. In one sense, this is obvious since no scientist claims to possess the absolute truth and one and all acts and, and one and all expect the current scientific rep representation of nature be to be overthrown in some future scientific revolution. Most scientists would say the scientific universal is the method of observation, experiment, and specific types of abstraction, such as quantitative measurement and calculation. Understood epistemologically, these features of modern science organize the discovery of truths or at least what scientists use for truths while they last. But understood in ontological terms, something very different is involved, not the construction of a more or less true representation, but the constitution of a specific object, the modern concept of nature. The universality of modern science lies in this process of ontological construction, not in any particular truth. The natural scientific idea of nature systematically negates lived experience. This is the downfall of Bacon's idols. It strips away the embodied and imaginative relation to the objects of experience central to all non-modern forms of knowing, to all cultures. This negation enters experience as disenchantment <coughs> and authorizes the exploitation of nature as mere raw material. To the extent that modern societies realize this negation in their mentalities and institutions, they undermine their own basis in the natural world with the consequences we now recognize as impending environmental catastrophe. This has been the tendency of Western culture for several centuries, centuries and it is now a global tendency. Reification and de-reification are characterized by their destructive relation to immediate experience and the cultures that arise from it. It is their negativity that ensures their universality. They do not posit absolute truths, but their relative truths flow from the application of methods that know no limits. 
although they arise in the capitalist West. They are capable of undermining all cultures all over the world. This conception of modern knowledge suggests an explanation for the success of science in displacing other knowledge traditions, as well as an account of the corrective force of de-reifying historical knowledge. Just as the nature of modern science emerges through the negation of the lived experience of nature in the West, so can negate other experiences of nature, other ontologies, and establish its supremacy on a global scale. <clears throat> the effectiveness of its technology is especially persuasive, but the nature it conquers is tailored to culturally relative expectations and denies many aspects of nature more adequately represented in other cultures and in our own past. Lucas argues for the congruence of the scientific technical reification of experience in capitalism. A science undermines the lived experience of nature, so the market erodes customs and traditions. Together they project certain basic features of Western culture globally, while opening up the entire planet to exploitation. The cultural bias of technology is tied up with capitalist development that mobilizes a similar negative force through the market. I explain this culturally specific aspect of Western universalism in the next chapter in terms of the concept of formal bias. The process of disenchantment provokes counter tendencies that reveal its bias. The universality of science and technology meets a limit in the harm that goes along with capitalist development, most obvious today from such problems as the intensive exploitation of factory labor, massive pollution, and unprecedented urban squalor. These side effects of progress first appear in the condition of the proletariat in Western capitalism, but today are found in exaggerated forms in the developing world. Lucas shows that Marxism is based on the critical relation of the proletariat to its reduction to wage labor. This reduction negates the lived experience of the working class under capitalism. The reifying logic of scientific, technical rationality here applies beyond nature to human society. What in relation to nature was the construction of the abstract object of scientific rationality becomes in social terms the imposition of an abstract economic form on living human beings. Resistance to this imposition reveals society as a unique object with a different structure from nature. It is composed of individuals possessed of consciousness and will. The universal destructiveness of reification is now met with another universal. The struggle to reestablish the human dimension of experience cancelled by reification. And like natural science, the de-reifying theory of society constructs an object through specific methodological procedures. Lucas summarizes these procedures as knowledge of the totality, that is, as the reduction of every apparently substantial social object to its functional relation to the whole of society and to the practices that support that relation. Marxism exemplifies this, metal, this methodology. <laughs> Marxism exemplifies this methodology. The de-reifying reduction Marxism applies to capitalism has the paradoxical effect of validating aspects of the lived experience of the working class. Capitalist forms are contrasted with the social content on which they are imposed. The effect of reification is thereby cancelled and transcended. The immediacy of capitalist experience is overcome just as capitalism itself overcame the immediacy of the lived experience on which it was imposed. <clears throat> Now lived experience returns not as a narrow local culture, a tradition, but as a futural demand for the material conditions of a decent life. This demand may be inflected culturally, but such basic elements as adequate sustenance, shelter, medical care, education, dignity, and respect, opportunities to develop and apply capacities qualify it as relatively universal, at least in a modern or modernizing context. These are, so to speak, the primary qualities of a humane world. Like science, technology, and capitalism, de-reification can travel wherever they intrude. This is the methodological basis of Marxist universalism. Lucas's constructivism, objections, and replies.
Many of the issues discussed in this chapter receive a very different treatment and a very different language in recent science and technology studies. In this concluding section, I will formulate and respond to some of the objections a constructivist scholar might address to my presentation of Lucas's views on science. While I do not claim that Lucas anticipates constructivism, I do believe he is closer to it than might seem possible on a superficial reading. Objection 1. It is confusing to qualify the objects of natural science as really or essentially reified, since reification is an illusion that hides the social processes underlying all objects, whether natural or social. Like social objects, natural objects are grounded in the practical activities in which they are constructed. They have a processual character as intrinsically bound up with these activities, distinguishing them from social processes as essentially reified confuses reification with objectivity. And this is the response. <coughs> it is true that real in the usual sense contrasts with illusion, and certainly reification is illusory in at least one aspect. However, the sense in which the nature of natural science is really reified is not this usual one. We saw in chapter 5 that reification is neither a mental state nor a thing, but is the thing-like appearance of the system of practice. Reification is real to the extent that this appearance has real consequences. The difference between the reification of nature and society has to do with these consequences. Lucas, Lucas accepts that there are several ways of being an object and many kinds of objectivity that are not reified. Reification is only one way with a very specific meaning it is not identical with objectivity in general. A reified object is one that has the form of an independent fact governed by laws. All four terms are important. A reified object has a form in the sense that it is measurable and isolable. As we saw in chapter four, factuality is not the only such form, but is, but is, sorry, but is a specific way in which objects present themselves. A reified object is governed by laws in the sense that a rule can be found explaining its motion, whether it be a natural law or the logic of a system of social interactions. Its apparent independence means that whatever social processes were involved in its institution are occluded. To argue that certain types of objects are really or essentially reified does not mean that no such processes underlie their existence, <clears throat> but their reified form is unalterable in practice. In such cases, it is possible to reveal the process of reification of the object theoretically, but with no effect on the object itself. This distinguishes natural scientific objects, which are not undermined by learning how they were discovered from certain social objects that cannot withstand self-consciousness. Objection 2. The main feature of reification is the unconsciousness of the practices in which objects are constituted. Dereification consists in the discovery of the constituting practices. <coughs> Were scientists to become conscious of the constructive role of their practices, science would be dereified, even without refuting any specific theory. Such a dereification would have a general transformative impact on research. And response. This is not quite Lucas's understanding of reification. While it is true that unconsciousness of reifying practices is a necessary condition for the constitution of reified social objects, these objects are de-reified not simply in the knowledge of the practices, but in the effects of that knowledge on the practices. Knowledge of nature simply does not respond to self-consciousness. In fact, scientists are fully aware of the practices in which they construct their objects, without that changing the nature of the objects one iota. This is the meaning of the constructivist methodological rule, follow the actors. Such knowledge is not a dereification in the full sense, since scientists continue to represent nature as a factual, law-governed realm independent of the observer. To cease to do so and to tie research to its specific practical basis would undermine the knowledge claim characteristic of science. It would be inconsistent with the constructivist analysis itself. 
because it would systematically remodelize and localize factual propositions laboriously constructed as independent of the observer and universally valid regardless of local context. <clears throat> Objection 3. These arguments set up all sorts of dualisms, a dualism of knowledge of objects and objects in themselves, a dualism of scientific nature and nature and everyday experience, and dualism of nature and society are these defensible claims. Response. Are objects identical with our knowledge of them since we have no other access to them? Claiming the contrary seems to imply a God's eye view from nowhere. But this radical constructivist notion is politically dangerous as it leaves no grounds for contesting the current state of knowledge in the name of the way things really are. Knowledge of objects and objects themselves can be distinguished without assuming an absolute observer in terms of the incompleteness of all human knowledge. We do not need to know what things are independent of our knowledge of them to know what we do. To know what we do not know. Sorry, to know... To know that we do not know them completely and to suspect that we do not even know them correctly. How can the reified nature of natural science be both independent of the observer and only one perspective from which to perceive nature alongside another perspective that would be that of everyday experience? Is a nature that is relative to a perspective truly independent? Operational definitions are necessary here to block metaphysical assumptions. On Lucas's terms, to say that the nature of natural science is independent of the observer is to say no more than that it is not transformed by self-consciousness, i.e. by knowledge of the practices in which it is constituted. This is compatible with the relativity of scientific nature to a specific perspective. How can we distinguish essentially reified nature from the contingent reification of society given the imbrication of society in nature and technology? It is important to bear in mind that the reified nature in question is that of natural science, not the nature we directly experience in the life world. The natural scientific concept of nature is an abstract object of theoretical representation, not a concrete reality. Observation and experiment and the technology employed in research all serve in the construction of such a representation. Its reification is essential because natural science casts everything into the form of factuality in order to know it. The knowledge associated with technology, such as engineering knowledge, is also reified, but actual technologies are more complex than these theoretical representations. They belong to the life world and therefore to society. Although they have a reified aspect, they are not essentially reified. Objection 4. Lucas claims that scientific and technical practice are contemplative rather than transformative. This is paradoxical since nothing has changed the world more than science and technology. Marx's notion of transformative practice is unalienated labor in which nature and society mediate each other mutually, not a purely social self-consciousness distinct from nature. Response Lucas's critique of what he calls contemplative practice concerns modern technical control in accordance with reified law. Science and technology are contemplative in the sense that they alter only superficial features and not the law of the object. They presuppose that law is the basis from which to modify those features. In the case of action on nature, this is inevitable. One cannot act on the laws of nature, only discover and use them to act on the objects they govern. In the case of society, the matter stands differently. The laws of social interaction that govern systems of practice such as the market can be changed by the coordinated efforts of the individuals who enact them. This is transforming practice. Marx's concept of unalienated labor is also transformative, but this is not the only kind of transformation he recognized. Revolution is also transformative, and this is what Lucas attempts to explain with his theory of reification and dereification. But, admittedly, the relation between the two types of transformative practice is complicated. What Lucas understands by dereification extends in principle to the labor process and technological artifacts, but he does not explain how. To do so, he would have to distinguish between two related dimensions of work and technical artifacts, their social meaning and the control of nature they make possible. These two dimensions are confounded under capitalism 
but they must be distinguishable if socialism is to overcome reification.